Well, hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this training presentation. Uh, my name is Tom Poland and it's my privilege and pleasure to be your, your host this morning. Um, we've got on the call doing training this morning SEO for growth and demystifying SEOs, Rebecca Corot. Rebecca, a very good, well, it be afternoon, your time in New Zealand, it's still good morning here in Queensland. How are you? I'm really well. Great to be with you. Well, it, and it's great. Thanks for rocking up. Um, Rebecca and I have done a couple of these over the last few years, and it's always solid value, and that's why I'm delighted to have invited her back and delighted that she's accepted my invitation to talk about SEO, uh, which is, if you think about marketing, you know, it, it's essentially the intersecting an ideal client with an effective marketing message. And SEO can be very confusing and very complex, and Rebecca has some very practical and implementable methodologies for making sure that when people are trying to find you, not by name, but by service or by how you benefit clients, that they can actually do that. Uh, she's a business-to-business -business marketing and customer relations management specialist. She's got vast experience across Australia, New Zealand, uh, Australasia, generally European, US markets. Uh, she delivers tactical digital marketing insight which, which is, this, this is the frontline stuff. This is the stuff that actually works, right? Not just the concepts, the theories. Uh, but she frames that around this sort of step-by-step -step method, method, methodical, uh, practical process. And, and, and that's why a lot of people who are not SEO specialists like myself, and probably yourself, find it her much easier, infinitely easier to understand than someone who's speaking, you know, marketing tech. So, so as, as an expert in search engine marketing and also direct response, she's a very good copywriter. Her, Rebecca's focus is really on this sort of, as I said, practical digital marketing that suits small, medium-sized enterprises like yours and mine. She's, she's known for her involvement with the sport of rowing. She's a rowing fanatic, and she's actually commentated for the BBC at the London Olympics, which is pretty extraordinary. It must have been a, a real blast, that one. Rebecca, without further ado, adieu, I will hand the stage over to you. Thank you. Tom, that's a lovely introduction. Hi, everybody. Before we start, I really need to know that you can use the questions panel in the GoToWebinar control panel. So let's just test it out. Can you see on the right-hand side, there's an orange arrow, and if it's pre pointing to the left, click it and it'll expand. And in the questions tab, just expand the arrow and type in your name, and tell me what the weather's like where you are so that I can tell that you can see exactly um, what's going on and then I can see your questions. Um, so what I'm going to do is, oh, uh, I pressed the wrong button. There we go, that's better. Um, have a quick look at what you've got coming up. Um, here we go. Paul says it's overcast in Hobart. Paul, I'd just like to tell you that at lunchtime today in Auckland, it was rain coming at a sort of 45 degree angle. So we're definitely doing one of those uh, four seasons in one day. Anyone else care to just throw into the questions bit what your name is and where you're at? And uh, here we go. Oh, Robin, that's good to know. Robin says it's sunny uh, where she is in uh, Wanganui, which is lucky you, only just up, um, down the line from us. Um, but it's nice to know. Now, while we're warming up, I am, oh, Maria, here we go. She says, both overcast and warm, says Maria. So uh, that's really nice to know. Um, Oriwa obviously is looking quite good. In fact, Ian just says it's, it's Ian in Oriwa, but he might be raining. I'm not quite clear. Um, <laughs> really good to know. One of the things that I want to really rock on today is ensuring that you walk away with things that you can do. And I'll be completely straightforward. 80% of what I show you today, you can do yourself. So search engine optimization is something that is often seen as being confusing, technical, hard to do. I've got good news for you. Google has won the SEO war. There has basically been a fight from the beginnings of the internet, which was that the search engine optimization people tried to cheat Google and gain their algorithm by making up clever ways that they could get their clients 
websites to display on page one. Now, two things have happened that mean that this is no longer a problem, or rather it's far, far, far less of a problem. Number one, search is increasingly local. So Google shows you results that reflect your physical location. You probably notice, if you use your phone, that it says Google would like to track your location or use your location to give you answers. And you usually say yes. What this means is that you get results that are close by, physically, geographically, to where you are. The second thing is that Google has changed its algorithm many, many times, but the most recent changes have been specifically designed to make what you write on your website very highly prioritized in the results that Google serves up. And this means that it's under your control, because you and I and Tom and everyone else manages the words on our own website. This is terribly important. So if you get an approach from an SEO agency who says, we can put you on page one of Google, they are probably ignorant and certainly they are not up to date because their page one of Google and mine and yours are all different. They are not the same. And so nobody can guarantee this. And this is really, really important. And this is why the command of using search engine optimization, making your website show up for the things you do and to show up in front of the right sort of people who you want to work with is making it easier and easier for business owners like you and me. So let's have a quick look at what today is all about. Firstly, we're talking about an ongoing investment. If I was to ask you in the questions to tell me how many times since you launched your business you have substantially redesigned or rebranded your website, just pop a little answer into the questions tab. Because every time you change your website, you improve it. You add more functionality, more features, sometimes new pages, you make it more current and more up-to-date. So every single one of you that changes your website substantially is making an investment. And you know it, and you're going to continue to invest in that website. I'm going to show you today how the design of the website and search engine optimization are connected so that you can make an accurate judgment about whether or not your website is well representing what you do, how you can make those changes, a little bit about language and three-letter abbreviations, which I loathe, but will allow you to be smart and understand what people are trying to sell to you should you decide to hire an SEO expert, and how, lastly, to put search engine optimization into the day-to-day -day running and managing of your business that you're already knowing and doing. If you are only relying on word of mouth for your business, I'm not going to say you will definitely become insolvent, but you will be working at a distinct disadvantage and you will fail compared with other business owners. Let's have a look at why this is. Now, new websites are very, very, very unsuccessful at delivering on the promise that is offered to the people who are buying them. And I want to show you why 99% of new websites fail. And I will hazard a guess that probably 95% of existing websites are not as good as they could be. Let's have a look at why. A large number of websites are digital brochures. Those of us who are old enough to remember the days when every business had a printed brochure, a lot of businesses made their website into a digital version of the same thing. A digital brochure is not what a website is about, and that is one reason why beautiful looking websites often don't deliver. 
your website needs to balance the words and information on it, which is what I call content. Because bearing in mind, some of you might have e-commerce shops, some of you might be selling services, some of you might be uh, bloggers who just who want to sell services or education. So your website has to make a balance carefully between search engine optimization, so being found by search engines, and the things that you write. Just as a little aside now, anyone care to make a guess as to what the top five search engines are? Let's pop that into the questions pane while I'm talking. Thirdly, if your website is designed by a designer and they use something called a design-led process where they start with glorious images and layouts, it will almost certainly be in that 99% that fail. Web design has two elements to it. One is design, the other is development. And development is the back-end plumbing and wiring and technical bit of what makes your website do what you want it to do. Design is beautiful pictures. Unfortunately, pictures are very hard for search engines to read and understand. Humans have no problem whatsoever looking at a picture and understanding what it's about. Machines, which is effectively what an algorithm is, it's a machine that sits behind a search engine. Machines really fail, and humans are really good at this. Unfortunately, search engines are machines, and so your design has to balance the needs of a machine with the needs of a human being. Then we need to look at what you should not be selecting in terms of your web design. When you are talking to a web designer slash developer, you need to ask them about the process they go through. You need to find out from them and make your own mind up as to whether or not they are design-led or led by the features and the technical side, or whether there's a happy balance. You need to ask the people who you're talking to who in their team are the designers, who in their team are the people who are the technical side. Ask them to show you something that they have produced recently so that you can see whether or not they tend to be more, more design or more development. Get them to explain to you why what they're showing you is good slash innovative slash interesting or fulfilled the purpose of the website. And if you can, get them to show you the back end of the website, the content management system, because if you can see that they're fluent in how they move around it and click through it and know exactly where to go to show you things, you have a good idea that they actually spend a lot of time there. They appear to be casual visitors and they can't remember which the menu is going to show the answer to your question. That gives you a very good as to where their particular skills lie. Now, number five is PPC, more of this three-letter abbreviation. This stands for pay per click, and it's a general term for online advertising. A good example is Google AdWords or Facebook advertising. Can pay per click compensate for a lack of search engine optimization? Short answer is yes, of course it can. If you're prepared to throw money at advertising, you can make sure that a link to your website shows up when people search for pink rain jackets in Wanganui. However, the minute you stop paying, your website disappears from search. And so if you have deep pockets, yes, you can do it, but this is not a long-term strategy. And it certainly isn't a strategy that I would advocate for most of my clients. For many of us, paying a bit in order to have our website display is a good thing and definitely worth talking about. So your modern web design is about winning the marketing war and ensuring that you've hired a web designer who understands the development side of things as well. Let's have a quick look at 
uh, some websites that I've seen, which I think are good and bad. Now, Deborah, thank you for your suggestion about the search engines. She put Google, Bing, and Yahoo. You're not wrong, but you should also include YouTube, eBay, and Amazon. A very, very large number of people go straight to those websites to get answers to questions. Let me just show you something. Here is Google. We're all pretty familiar with um, what Google looks like. And on the page, you will see, on, if you follow my mouse, this little microphone at the end of the search bar, search by voice. This has been here for a long time, but the next big wave of technological development is voice activation and speaking to computers. And we're aware of this with things like Siri and Alexa and Cortana, which are the automated personal assistants offered by large technology companies. One of the big things that has changed as a result of search by voice is in instead of typing in a phrase like um, gloves, and as you can see here, Google is making helpful suggestions like gloves in a bottle, gloves of silence, gloves boxing. People are beginning to say things like, where can I find the best rowing gloves? And so you get results that are reflective of speech rather than search phraseology. And as you can see, wonderful gloves here, including these wonderful pink ones, which obviously I'm delighted by. I want to show you now how to build stronger website SEO. And here's where we're going to search. We're going to start by trying to understand your existing website using a website audit. So I'm going to flick out of my slides and move to an example of a website. So this is not a client. This is a business that I happen to be familiar with, and it sells a rowing machine. It's a slightly old website, as you can see down the bottom here. It's got a 2013 um, copyright, which gives you and me a clue that, that chances are it hasn't been updated since that time. And an awful lot has happened in the world of online and websites since that time. Here's how to do an audit of a website. You need to use a Chrome browser, which is what I'm using here. And these little icons that my mouse is wibbling over are called extensions. And there's one here called WooRank, spelled W-O-O-R-A-N-K. Now, you find your, go and just Google how to find and install an extension. But if you click the WooRank extension, what they do is they do a quick appraisal of the quality of your website against well-known criteria, which include the content, the technology of the back-end development, and also good practice for marketing. And they give you a score out of 100. So here's the summary, and it's completely free to use, so you do this right now on your own website. And it gives you a traffic light system of things that are green, things that are amber, and things that are red, so pretty easy. It gives you lots of adverts as well, so we're just going to zizz through them. But let me talk you through the elements here. SEO is what it starts with, and that gives you a clue as to the focus here. The title tag for the entire website, home root domain, which is pretty much the home page, is the word home. Now, this tool, this WooRank assessment tool, doesn't make a judgment on that. But I will tell you that that is a lousy description of this entire website, because every website has a home button. You want a website that describes itself in an appropriate way. And you can see what the um, title tag is, because back up here in the tabs, you can see that it says the word home, whereas here, 
the one next door actually explains the name of the business, which is a good start. And this one here says the name of the business plus a statement, a three-word statement about what they do. So this business is losing a massive opportunity there. Meta descriptions, so that's a deeper description of what the website's about. And it says, row perfect, don't just row, row perfect. Well, that's a nice slogan, but it is not a description of what you can do on this website. And I can tell you that what you're do they're trying to do is sell rowing machines. What they're not doing is telling search engines that that's what they do. You've got 160 characters you can use. They're using 40. Here's the preview if you search for it on Google. The name of the website is home. We've already identified that's a problem. The URL is accurate. And here is the description. 40 characters when they could have two lines of text. A very poor display. So if you don't know the name of this business and you were searching for rowing machines, it would all, in all likelihood not show up because the words rowing machine aren't in those three key bits of information. In the keywords cloud, which appraises all of the text on this page, which is the home page, yes, it does have the word rowing and the word machine. So let's have a look at them. These keywords need to be consistent, and Google looks at three things, single words, pairs of words, and groups of three words. And here they're appraising them by frequency. Are they in the title? We already know they're not, because the title is the word home. Are they in the description? And are they in some of the headings which are tagged as H tags on the website? So a website has headings which descend in numerical order from H1 to H6. The most important information is your H1 header, and obviously it goes down from there. As you can see here, they're missing a lot of opportunities. They look at the frequency that each word is used. Let's go down to the two word assessments. And again, there a couple are used in the headers, but they could be using them in a couple of other places and getting a better score. Next, we go on to pictures. I said the pictures were potentially problematic because machines can't read pictures. An alt attribute is a bit of information that is put with a picture so that a machine can read what the picture is, and you tell it what this is. So you say, this is a picture of a girl holding a kitten. Now, here they say they found three images, and one of them has got an empty or missing alt attribute, and it is an uploaded image called logo. So that's pretty obvious probably what it is, but they would do well to explain in the upload, this is the Row Perfect Australia logo. Now let's move on to something else. This is something WWW Resolve. This helps tell traffic that has come to your website where you want it to go if someone puts in a slightly different URL. So as it explains here in the red, search engines see www and the URL and the URL without the W as two different websites with the same content. That's a red flag in and of itself. This causes them to see duplicates, which they don't like. So there isn't a redirect in place sending traffic to the www as if they were the same URL. So pretty easy to do. It is a five-minute job for their developer. He hasn't done it. They haven't told him or her to do it. A robots file, this is really good. This is about an index of the website that allow, tells the robots where to go, and it's really important. It basically comes as default with most good reputable content management systems. A content management system is something like this is Joomla. That's the symbol for Joomla, or WordPress, or Concrete 5 or 101 others. Here's another big no-no. A sitemap is the family tree of all the pages in your website, showing what they are and how they connect to each other. Helping the robots navigate this quickly, you do it by uploading an XML sitemap. And as this explains, these contain a list of your URLs that are available to index. And so not every page you want to be seen by search engines, but the ones that are available, you need them to do it easily, and they haven't got one. 
they've got straightforward URLs. They don't like underscores. They like dashes in URLs. But as you can see, they haven't got any problems with this. They haven't found a blog. Now, you don't have to have a blog. But a blog is a very good way of updating your website on a regular basis. And so having one is good for search engine optimization. Scrolling down, this is what the website looks like in mobile. As you can see, none of the images show up on the small screen. And the big screen one looks OK, um, but it probably is not a responsive site. Now, it says the website has a favicon. This is this tiny little icon that sits up here in the tab. It actually does, but it, it's advertising the um, content management system, not the business. So you probably want to have one that is like this or this, which is the um, logo or a small part of the logo of the business. It's got very small page size, again, a reflection of the fact that it's an old website, which doesn't matter. And it loads slowly. There are some tools that if you're interviewing a web developer, you ask them what their favorite plugins are to decrease load time. So one of the important things about understanding how websites are built is that behind the scenes, if you go and look at the source code, um, and you can do this quite easily yourself if you're interested, you can see the list of elements that make up the page. And some of these, a lot of them, are hidden. Now, these load in the order in which they are designated. For a human being, you want the pictures and the words that you can see to load first, and then the hidden secret technical stuff to load later. This website hasn't done that. So it's very slow to load because the technical back-end information is loading simultaneously with the pictures and that makes for a slow overall response time. So there are plugins that are called caching plugins that allow you to, when someone has, is visiting your website for the second or third time, to pre-load pictures and larger images and save a local copy of that in your cookies on your own computer so that when you return to the website, they appear to load faster. They actually do that because they're downloading a local copy served from your computer rather than one that's actually coming from the server where the website's hosted. Other things that website developers do, they declare the language. So it's a very good test of whether it's a designer or developer. You can say, is it important to declare the language on a website? Are you using a structured data markup? You don't really need to understand it. You need to ask questions like that. If they don't know what it is, it's a red flag. So oh, then they try and sell you some domains. Don't worry about that. It then shows you the IP address of their server and what different technologies they are using. Whoops, I pressed the wrong button there. Sorry. Um, so that just gives you more of a clue of things that you can do and how to appraise your website. So. My website gets a score of about 73 out of 100. So go and download the WooRank tool and have a look at how it displays for your website. You'll give you some clues about what you can do to improve. I think you've seen some of the design and SEO imbalance information that I've shown you here. And you're beginning to see how the functionality and the features match and both support the overall goal of your business. We've talked about URL structure and sitemaps. Keywords have been shown up. And if those keywords don't match what you think they should be on your website, there are some reasonably straightforward things that you can do to rewrite the text you think they should. So rich snippets is really, really cool. Do you remember me showing you the boxing gloves on the, um, my search? Well, a rich snippet was that bit at the top of the page where it showed six or seven photographs of different boxing gloves for sale, which all instantaneously linked out to e-commerce stores. If you ever search for a recipe, 
Google will try and serve you the best possible recipe answer at the top of the page. And that's a rich snippet. If you ever search for a movie actor, often you find that they do exactly the same thing and it's a mixture between their Wikipedia page or their IMDB database entry. So the more you're able to put information into your website that could be captured in a rich snippet, the better. Internal and external links for your website really help the search engines understand and contextualize what you're doing. So internal links are very straightforward. If you, for example, write an article about pink block boxing gloves, you can include either in the article or near the bottom of the article links to other relevant articles. So that might be matching pink t-shirts uh, or boxing shoes or other types of gloves that are different colors. And you can see how each of those bits of information relate to what you're writing about. And if they happen to be articles you've got on your website, it provides an internal link from one page to the next. A really important thing for you to think about when you're reviewing your own website is go and look at a page and ask yourself one question. What do I want the visitor to do next? You've got them onto this page about pink boxing gloves. What do I want them to do? Do I want them to buy? Do I want them to go to a shop and try now? Do I want them just to read more about other things that are pink? If you give a visitor too many choices, the chances are they won't make any choice. So focusing your expected action from your visitor into as few options as possible is a really, really good way of making your website flow better. External links are links into your site from places that are not on your domain. Good examples are local search. So if you go to my website and search for an article I've written on local search, I've listed something like 36 different places where you should have your website listed. And these are things like Hot Frog, Yellow Pages, Finder, if you're in New Zealand, Localist and Neighbourly all really good places where you can legitimately and for free link your business back to your business website. If you have clients who are prepared to link to you, that's another great opportunity. If you get mentioned in the media, I wrote a blog post for a very nice man called Graham who has a marketing blog on the New Zealand Herald website. That's a big newspaper here. And he linked into my website to a specific article from his blog post. That obviously is a very powerful incoming link. We've talked a little bit about image tags and you should also ask your web developer about whether how your website shows up for mobile. If you check your monthly website visitor statistics, which most of us use Google Analytics as the tool for that, you will find that month by month, if you search back over the history, more and more people are coming to your website using a mobile device rather than a laptop or a desktop. For some of my clients, more than 50% of their traffic is coming from mobiles. This means that you must have a responsive website design, which means that the content resizes to fit the screen of the person who's viewing it. And if you can design for mobile first, that actually makes it even better. And if your website designer understands what mobile first is, you could say to them, please write me a proposal as to what you would do to improve our website in order to put a mobile first strategy in place. So in summary, good website flow is when you get your visitor to go through your website with a very clear path to get to their destination. Signposting, things like those hyperlinks we've talked about, and linking between pages within your website. These help humans, as well as the bots that the um, uh, search engines use. I'm going to give you a good example here of signposting. This is a real estate agent here in Auckland, and we did some work with them to streamline the flow through their website. We simplified their menu so that 
It has very short words, but they pretty much say exactly what they do. And very few of them, except for these, have a drop-down menu. And we also appraised what does someone want to do when they come to a real estate agent's website. And they have a very, very clear binary pathway. You are usually there to either buy or to sell. Therefore, we made it even easier for a first-time visitor to get to where they wanted. We put these big red buttons on the home page. I'm buying. If you look at the URL on the bottom left, you can see it says it goes straight to their listings page. I'm selling. Guess what? It goes to a page about selling and somewhere in the middle where we asked for evaluation. Now, the reason the valuation is there because that is a preliminary step towards selling. Bear in mind that real estate agents make most of their money from selling other people's houses rather than enabling buyers to buy. So they want the listings. The other thing that we did with their website menu, which you can do, is that we, in the English speaking world, read from left to right. Therefore, put your most important information on the left hand end of your menu. Everyone expects the logo to be the home page link. Everyone expects the contact and about us pages to be on the right hand end. But if selling is more important than buying or investing, put it up there first. Let me show you what actually happens. This is another little tool, which is a Google Analytics extension here. You can find it. It's called Page Analytics. You need to be authorized on the analytics account for that particular website for it to work. And it's an on-off toggle. As you can see, I've toggled it on here. And it gives you a little orange box, and it tells you the percentage of traffic that clicks on each hyperlink on the page. So here we go. The logo, the home page, gets 47% of all clicks. We also have home as a separate item. That gets more clicks, which is 53%. Then they have their principal product getting 4.5%. The shop gets 1.4%. The blog gets 0.2%. The podcast up a bit, 1.6%. And the about us, 0.3%. 62% of people here search on the website. How interesting is that? Now, if you have your search bar powered by Google Analytics, it will also tell you what the words were that people typed in there so that you can improve the layout and internal linking of your site. Let's have a look at that. Get your web developer to do this. Log into your Google Analytics. On the left-hand sidebar, there's a side menu called Acquisition. Scroll down to Search Console. Now, this has to be linked to your Google Search Console, and your developer will set that up for you. If they don't know how to, you need a developer who knows. And then go to Queries. And this is what I have displayed here at the moment. This shows me the search query that this website is showing up for when people search. Number one is not, sadly, 2,749 or 73% of the web traffic is not set, which is this information. And don't uh, pass spending with them. Is the name of the company, so that's pretty obvious. Number three is their principal product. But let's have a look at these different columns. This is an approximation of the monthly search volume for each of these phrases. Look at this one, number four, rowing gloves. 1,300 people a month search for this. If I wanted to advertise, I would pay 74 US cents for every click. Ooh, look at this. It does really, this website does really well in terms of the competition for this particular phrase. 16 clicks came through, 193 people did a search, and this website was in the search results. Gives you a click-through rate, which is the ratio of those two columns, 8.29, which is very high, 
and it says that the average search position is number five. So Google shows 10 results of natural search per page. It adds adverts to the top and bottom of that as well. So anything um, from 10 down to one is good because you are on page one. So if you look down just this column here, this website is doing very well indeed for quite a lot of these terms. And we have to go quite a long way down there. We've got down to a 9.9. .9. Now there's, and so that's the last one. And knowing where your search phrases show up and how many people click through having seen your website because they've searched on this phrase gives you a really good idea as to exactly how well your website is doing. Now let's move on to a little bit about link building. Links are important because the PhD that Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the founders of Google, wrote, which is what gave them the idea for the whole business called Google, is that you can assess not just the importance of a website, but its relevance based on who links to it. So the creation of the hyperlink is one of the most intense innovations in the history of marketing. If I write a hyperlink and link to your website, I'm giving a signal to a human or a robot visitor that there is a relevant connection between these two web pages. Now, the link has two parts, and this is why they're so important. It's not just the fact that you link to me, it's also the words that you use to make the link. As you know, you can hyperlink a phrase or you can type in the full URL. And nowadays, we're quite used to seeing words that are highlighted in a contrasting color as being hyperlinked. Sometimes they're underlined, they're often blue. If you hyperlink saying click here for information and you hyperlink the word here, a robot, which is a very literal thing, will think that it is about something called here. If, on the other hand, my hyperlink says, read about pink boxing gloves, and the hyperlink is the words pink boxing gloves, the link can be the same, but the fact that the words I've chosen are different. This gives you an enormous head start in SEO because it's telling the robot that pink boxing gloves is what we're using and what the relevance is to these two connections, words plus a hyperlink. So that's why backlinks are really, really important. Get them from outside there, you can have them inside your site, so internal links. You need to make sure that you are using good keywords for those phrases that you're linking. I described how to do it, but make sure they align with the keywords that are relevant to you, your business, your products, and your services. Does anyone know how to find the backlinks that already exist from their website? Now you do this in Search Console. Search Console is the sister um, company or organization to Google Analytics. And it is the tool that webmasters use to set up your website and to enable it to get read by the Google spiders. It has a tool in it that allows you to find your backlinks. You can also go to some free online services. Just search for a free backlink finder. And you can go and it'll crawl your website. You type in your URL and tell you the places that are linking to you. Here's the important thing. Not all backlinks are created equally. Google ranks websites on a scale of one to 10. There are very few tens. They are things like the BBC, Google itself, CNN, a lot of the news organizations. When you have a brand new website, you start at one. You used to start at four. And Google reappraises the importance of your website based on the volume of traffic and the sort of links that you have in and out. The more traffic your website gets, the more likely you will have a good um, number on your page uh, on on the website. So the one I showed you earlier, 
um, which we did the analytics search on is a page rank four. Creative Agency Secrets My Business is a page rank three. If you find backlinks that are not something you are proud of, you can tell Google to ignore these. You don't have to go to the website owner and ask them to remove it, which you used to have to do. You can disavow them, where you basically say, ignore this link. And that's really important to do. Because this was one of the naughty things that search engine optimization firms used to do in order to boost clients' websites apparently to a page one position. If you remember earlier, I said that no one nowadays can guarantee a page one listing. And one of the ways they did it was private blog networks, which is a PBN. What these were, were websites where they would create blogs which linked out to their clients' websites and linked to other private blog networks. So if they had a whole bunch of them and a rival SEO firm also had a whole bunch of them, they'd form a collaboration and they'd all link to each other's clients' websites. And although this was an extremely effective way of creating a large number of incoming links using relevant keywords, if you actually went to the site, you'd find that it was about all sorts of random stuff and really had no relevance to the actual website. Now, one of the Google algorithm changes that happened recently has penalized any of this type of linking. So you need to find out where your website's links are coming from and whether or not you're proud of them. Number six, what you write needs to be balanced with the need for backlinks. It's easier to write good content than it is to find a website that's prepared to link back to you. But if you write good content, you can offer it to other websites and they may choose to use it and they may choose to link back to you. And there are specific strategies that a good marketing agency can tell you that you can set up in order to encourage that. I mentioned local directories earlier. Don't forget them. There are quite a few services where you can pay a small amount of money. I think it's 30 or $40 a month, and you get your directories updated automatically. Um, and this is well worth doing because there are a huge number of online directories, many of which you probably have never heard of. Let's know what our pet do. So when you go and find your backlinks, you can go and find competitors too, which is kind of cute. You can go and see what is driving there and decide whether or not that's a tactic that you want to follow. I'll give you one tip, which is not in this slide, about creating good quality backlinks. Has anyone ever seen the website Quora? Q-U-O-R-A have a look at it. It is a website that exists to answer questions. I'm registered there, so it's going to take me in to places which follow topics that I'm already interested in. Here are a bunch of notifications where someone has requested that I answer a specific question. I've had 281 views on my answer this week, and I've crossed the 7,500 views. How exciting. Anyone can answer, ask or answer a question. But the more you can answer a question that actually then includes a link back to your website, the better. So if you have a look at the things that I've written, some of the things like this, I wrote an answer that includes links to client websites so that people could buy a DVD, subscribe to a product, and subscribe to a, this is actually a link to a blog post. I wrote a good answer, but I'll give you a tip. I also took that exact answer and put it onto the client's website as well so that people who ask the same question, what are the best rowing books, can find the answer not only on the client's website, but also on Quora. Guess what? Quora gets a ton more traffic, but it's a very highly rated website, and it will send me really good traffic. Here's the Mozbar, which is another extension. You can tell I rather like extensions. And it gives you um, 
some clues. Oh, I'm not logged in, sorry, so I can't use it. But I was going to say it gives you a clue about how valuable the page is so that you can have a idea about whether it's worth your while getting a link from that website to your own. Managing reputation and reviews. So one of the joys of the internet is that anyone can say anything. One of the downsides of the internet is that anyone can say anything. We need to ensure that our brand and the people who work for our firm and our products and services have high quality reputations online. So how are we going to do that? Firstly, you need to know for your industry what are the most important review websites. For many of us, this is nothing more complicated than Google. Have you all got Google My Business registered? Let's just take a quick look at, um, whoops. Google My Business. So if I search for Creative Agency Auckland, guess what, this is me searching for me. One of the first things that will come up is a map. Here it is. You can see there's adverts above the map. Here is a map, and it shows us the top three results. One of them has got 4.6 stars. How wonderful. And they explain who they are and what they do. They've had 11 reviews. These people, these people, nothing. Can you imagine who is going to bother then to click through and start to trawl through a much larger and longer list of marketing agencies? Oh, look, there's us. We're on the first page of the map, and we've got a 4.9 star out of 12 reviews, whereas Tenfold has got a 5 star out of one review. Obviously, I hope you're going to pick me. But it gives you some clues about the quality of an individual business. Of course, you go and check it out. But you have to admit that it looks a lot more attractive than someone who hasn't got any reviews. Now, you can go and click through and have a look at this, but the way you get to here is Google My Business. So google.com forward slash business. Google sends you a postcard in the mail and you register your business and they then know that you are at a physical location that you register and then you get to show up on maps like that. And that's like a rich snippet, which I talked about earlier. So if you are in an industry that has review websites, and I was in Harvey Norman the other day looking to buy a new iron, don't ask, it was a painful experience, but I looked up every single iron make model number on my phone while I was in the shop to see what people had said about them. And I made my decision based on positive reviews and negative reviews. Your customers and prospects will be doing the exact same thing. So if you don't have a page on your website that has testimonials, if you don't have uh, your reputation very clearly flagged in the public pages of your external persona for the business, you need to do something about this. We have clients who deliberately seek out reviews because, as point six here says, they have a business process to get reviews, and they put them on their website with month and year dates because the most recent ones at the page really well there's no reason why you and I shouldn't do this okay I've only got 12 reviews and triple buyers <laughs> thousands and thousands the principle is something we can all do I see a review as a personal recommendation I may not know the person who has made the recommendation but an independent review website can't be gained by a business it's a review on Google My Business. It has been written by Google. The company cannot use in there. You can use your own personal Gmail to check, but you're quite noticed if you have a company and you've also written a review. And reviews are called social proof. They are 
are a way of ensuring that there is an apparently independent voice of the customer who gives you a quantity of the person who wrote them. Again, TripAdvisor is an awfully good start, or Yelp is a very good place to go and look for how well-run websites manage their reviews. So I've seen ones that say, um, thank you for your review, you gave us one out of five. I can see that you mentioned three positive things, like the ambiance was good, the service was quick, um, the menu had an exciting choice range, but you waited a long time before you got seated. I do hope that, you know, your one-star review um, doesn't reflect the fact that we, you say we did three things really, really well. And I do hope that you understand we've taken on board your criticism. We're going to see what we can do to do better. But you moderate your response so that the reader goes, yeah, that was a bit harsh, you know, putting a one-star review and they actually said three nice things. And so it allows you to interject your point of view, not to pick a fight, but to try and make clear that the reviewer isn't the only voice in this conversation. And you can respond to your Google star ratings as well. Go and have a look at ours and you can see what we've put up there. So that's engaging. And the other thing is giving back. When someone gives you a review, how do you say thank you? Could you make a charity donation? Could you send them a little note in the post if you know them? Could you do something special that allows them to feel good about having helped you out. It's a very small thing, but I think it's one of the most powerful human motivators there are. It's called reciprocity. The principle of reciprocity is that I offer to buy you a coffee, you will want to buy me one back. And it's the same idea. If someone gives you a review, how can you say thank you back to them in a way that's meaningful for them? And remember, when a consumer searches online, they're in all likelihood already sold on buying. So now you've got a good website, it's got great reviews, you know what the SEO and the keywords are and it's performing well for you, but you can't stand still. It's like a triffid, you have to keep feeding it. So here are some things that you can do that are not very time consuming. Number one, content creation and management tools. These are all WordPress plugins and other services that we find helpful for our business and you quite probably will do too. Yoast SEO is a plugin for WordPress that helps tutor you in writing good content and showing up what it thinks the keywords are so that you get better at writing for robots who are looking for keywords and reinforcing, of course, the same keywords that you already want your website to show up for. Sucuri so is an anti-hacking plugin. It's paid for and it is worth every cent. Trust me, if your website gets hacked, it's going to cost you a lot more than $79 a year. Unbounce is a service that we use to create quick landing pages. It's a drag and drop design. You don't need a designer to use it and it allows you to send visitor traffic in a tracked basis through an individual page that has a specific purpose, usually sales or sign-ups. I've talked about Sumo Me before. This is a tool that we use to help get people signed up to newsletters. It's either a pop-up light box or a strip across the top of your website and it's a very good alert to helping people decide whether or not to join your newsletter in a discreet way. I've talked about Naverly, Google Analytics and AdWords. SBI is a keyword tool that is independent of Google. Google AdWords will suggest keywords for you that are relevant to your business, but it will always be suggesting keywords that it knows it can sell. And so in order to use an independent one that doesn't have the filthy lucre of Google making money off you, we use 
an independent tool which is called SBI. It's paid for. If you want us to do searches for you, get in touch and we can use it for your brand or your products. Search Console is the sister to Google Analytics as I talked about earlier. Moz is another really good tool that identifies and appraises your website and I already showed you WooRank. Have all of these in place and then plan what you are going to add to your website on a regular basis, your content creation. You don't have to write original articles every day of the week. You can curate other people's articles. If you find two or three articles on a similar topic, you can pull them together as a helpful story of all the best articles about pink boxing gloves. As point four says, there are ways of creating good content that is, does not require you to originate huge quantities of research. This is someone else. Really meant aggregation. Discussing long articles that other people have written is a very useful service. If you talk about technology, how it has changed in the recent past. enable quite a large number of different search phrases. Write something you want. By a very I could sell it because you can only buy it on Amazon.com and trust me, it is part of the world, the postage is a killer. So you don't want to get caught out by having to pay a heap, you can just get in touch and if that is what you want. Your website. I hope that You can hear me. Has it come back, Paul, Nadine? And yes, there will be a replay. So uh, definitely, I apologize for that. That my internet is playing up. Secondly, if you want us to review your website for the SEO and do the updates that are recommended, you can also buy this off our shop. And I'm going to give you a discount coupon here. 
If you put SEO for growth with the number four as four, it'll take three hundred dollars that price so that you get and that this is a little more affordable for your business. And for me to thank you. If you do anything else, buy the book. I can't recommend it enough. It's written for the layman. It explains what to do and how to do it. And if you're even 80% technical, you can do a lot of strategies and tactics that it recommends yourself. If, on the other hand, you want it done fast and done well first time, have a look at the service that we're offering as a starter pack. That any questions that I covered? Do you want me to go back to any of the slides that sound like I overlooked or the garbled bit came over? Yes, it is, Paul. It is New Zealand dollars. And if you are not in New Zealand, you will not pay our 15% GST. So it uh, works out a tad cheaper. Thank you, Maria. I appreciate your thanks. It was great having you on the call. And I'm going to wrap up now because it looks like there aren't any individual questions. If you're inclined to use LinkedIn, please connect with me. And I hope that we can do business together. And I hope that you can ask questions that I can answer. And I'll do my best to support you in the challenges that you're facing in your business. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.